Hey guys, it's Dr. Katz. I decided to start a new section on my YouTube channel and kick off my podcast uh, that's in the works with a new section that's just interesting stuff that I've seen in cardiology. And what I wanted to talk about today was Lyme carditis, basically how Lyme disease can actually impact the heart. So to start off, I just wanted to talk about the background of Lyme disease and what causes it. Lyme disease is actually caused by a bacterium called Borrelia burgdorferi and it's transmitted to humans via a tick or an infected tick. Basically out in the wild, a tick can bite an animal, get it from that animal, and then pass it on to humans. Lyme disease can cause a typical bullseye rash and it can often easily be seen on skin of lighter skinned people. It's a little bit more difficult to see on darker skinned individuals. And that rash normally manifests in about seven days, but can take anywhere from three to 30 days after the initial tick bite. Um, the medical term for this is actually erythema migrans, and it can, again, be seen in different skin people in a lot of different ways, but really, it looks classically like a bullseye. Other symptoms associated with Lyme disease can uh, be a headache, neck stiffness, severe joint pain, and the joints that are usually involved are the really big joints, joints like your knees. Why am I even talking about this? Why is a cardiology fellow talking about this? And that's because it can be complicated by Lyme carditis or inflammation of the heart itself. And it can cause a lot of conduction system issues. So what is Lyme carditis? Again, it's when the bacterium infects the heart tissue itself and disrupts the normal electrical conduction system of the heart. Normal conduction system goes from the SA node at the top down to the AV node and then the his Purkinje system to the ventricles. Fancy words for the SA node, the sinoatrial node. AV node is the atrioventricular and then it goes down to the ventricles. So it starts at the SA node, goes down to the AV node and then down to the ventricles. So it goes from the top to the middle and then down to the ventricles. What happens in Lyme carditis is it causes complete heart block or basically the AV node is unable to hear any message from the SA node down to the ventricles. Sorry for giving you guys the finger there. Again, normally the top chamber of the heart beats and then the bottom chamber of the heart beats. In Lyme carditis, when it causes complete heart block, the top chamber of the heart is beating independently and the bottom ventricle is beating independently on its own as well. Now the normal backup system for the heart at every stage, at the SA node, at the AV node and in the ventricles, there's a backup system. And normally when the SA node is working properly, it inhibits the AV and the ventricular backup system. When the ventricle isn't getting any electrical activity from the, bottom, from the top chambers of the heart, the ventricle will beat on its own through this backup system. The issue with it is that that backup system in the bottom chamber of the heart beats only at, a, at about 20 to 40 beats per minute. So normally when you think about what happens when you stand up, you stand up, and your heartbeat increases, your heart rate increases. You're moving around, you need more oxygen in your tissues, so your heart rate increases. But your ventricle is unable to do so, so your SA node, the top chamber of the heart, the atria, might be increasing in the rate, but the bottom chamber is gonna be staying at about 20 to 40 beats per minute. And that's why it causes symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, palpitations, you could feel like your heart's not beating correctly or a little bit off. Uh, you can have shortness of breath, chest pain in some more severe cases. And the normal way that your body adapts to this is by having you pass out. If the heart can't beat enough to supply blood to all of the uh, organs of your body or the brain, the easiest way that your body fixes that is by having you pass out so it doesn't have to work against gravity as well. And that's also another uh, common manifestation of complete heart block is that it can cause you to pass out. And that's a really dangerous um, manifestation of it. I've had plenty of patients who come into the hospital uh, in complete heart block and they say they've been feeling lightheaded or off, a little anxious, they've had having fluttering in the chest. And I've had one patient, been, they were walking up a flight of stairs carrying laundry. And previously when they were walking up the flight of stairs that day, they were feeling a little lightheaded, but they weren't that bad. But then when they were carrying something and needing a little bit extra oomph from their heart, it just couldn't keep up and they passed out and fell down the stairs. Thankfully that patient, you know, only ha only fell down, you know, backwards and, and was able to catch himself. But for patients who have complete heart block, this can be extremely serious. You can hurt yourself uh, in other ways. Now, not everyone who gets Lyme disease is gonna get Lyme carditis. In fact, uh, only about four to 10% of patients and sometimes uh, in other reports, it's that percentage of patients who get Lyme disease and then get Lyme carditis has been even lower at about 1%. Uh, 
contract, who, who contract Lyme disease end up getting Lyme carditis. And of those patients who get Lyme carditis, sometimes it's not as serious. Not everyone who gets Lyme carditis gets a uh, complete heart block. Common manifestations for the residents and med students out there is first degree heart block. And it can be an important marker of anyone who has Lyme carditis because first degree heart block is just a delay in the conduction of the top chamber of the heart to the bottom. But they're talking and communicating and listening to one another. But patients who do have first degree heart block are at an increased risk of potentially developing complete heart block. So those are another, that's another thing that we can see on your EKG or the electrical interpretation of the heart that will tell me that you should definitely be watched inside the hospital on continuous cardiac telemetry monitoring or those EKG leads that we keep on you and tether you to a, to a bed. Joking about being tethered, but it does often in the hospital end up being another thing that is attached to a patient. But in this instance, it's critically important because people, again, who have PR or uh, PR prolongation, or again, this first degree heart block can pr uh, advance to complete heart block. So what do we do? How do we treat Lyme disease? The first thing we do is we start you on antibiotics. We need to kill this bacteria. Often we might not be able to diagnose it right away because the blood test for Lyme disease takes a few days to come back. And we don't want to wait to treat this Lyme carditis to wait. We don't want to wait for the test to come back. We want to start treating you immediately so that you can start getting better. So we normally start ceftriaxone. It's an IV medication uh, inside the hospital. And ultimately we can transition it to an oral medication and you can continue a, a 14 to 21 day course of antibiotics typically when you leave the hospital. So the first thing we do is treat you with antibiotics. The second thing we often do you know, simultaneously is get blood work to confirm the diagnosis. And the third thing when we get involved is deciding on if you need a permanent or temporary pacemaker. A pacemaker is an implantable device that goes inside of the heart and it will stimulate the heart. And when you are not getting a, su a sufficient ventricular rate or when that bottom chamber of the heart is not beating quickly enough, it will give an electrical impulse and pace you. Now the question of who gets a pacer is dependent on how you progress. Thankfully, almost all patients, not everyone, but the huge majority of patients end up doing very well with antibiotics and do not require a permanent pacemaker. However, getting you to that point safely is critically important. And that decision-making requires us to start giving you the antibiotics and seeing how you do. If you're sitting in the bed, not moving, some patients do very well. And by restricting their mobility, we can keep them from developing those symptoms, developing end organ ischemia or a lack of blood flow to other vital organs. But if you're sitting in front of me and you're having chest pain or you're feeling short of breath and your ventricular rate's only 20, you know that we're gonna have to put in a temporary pacemaker. Now there's two basic types of temporary pacemakers that are outside the scope of this video, but the two main types are a temporary pacer or a temp perm pacer or a temporary permanent pacemaker. A temporary pacemaker goes in through the jugular vein in the neck and we float that wire in until it goes into the right ventricle and it kind of just sits inside the heart and touches the tip of the ventricle and allows us to pace you. Uh, the advantage is you can do it right at bedside. Emergency medicine physicians can do it. We can do it in the critical care unit or in the cardiac care unit. A better option if we can wait, if we can do this, because sometimes the patient is crashing and we have to do it right then and there. Uh, but sometimes what I prefer to do is put a temporary permanent pacemaker. And what the difference between a temp and a temporary permanent pacemaker in my mind is, is that this temporary permanent pacemaker is done in the cath lab by either an electrophysiologist or a interventional cardiologist. Often the difference is institutionally, you know, who does what at, a, at an organization. And it uses a, a pacemaker um, that we normally implant inside the chest and we attach that to a lead that actually screws into the heart. It is a tiny screw about smaller than the size of a coffee straw and it screws into the heart. And the advantage of that is that there's no chance that uh, instead of the floating wire, floating wires can kind of get jostled. If you cough or take a deep breath, it might move. Screwing it into the heart keeps it in there and guarantees that there will not be failure of that pacer lead. Now there are often complications of any procedure and you know the biggest complication that we worry about is perforation. If we're going into a body orifice, we can go right through it, but it happens exceedingly rarely and these devices are quite safe. 
The other thing is that these devices, the temporary pacer where we float it in, can only stay there for about 48 hours. Um, it depends if you go in through the neck or the groin. The groin is generally a dirtier place, so we don't like to keep it there for long. Whereas the temporary permanent pacemaker can stay there for about a week. Uh, the risk is that device that's going in through the neck and exposed to the outside air versus permanent pacemakers, which are uh, has a small incision in the skin and placed inside a pocket. These are exposed and can get an infection. If that infection gets to the heart, it could cause endocarditis or an infection of the heart valve itself or the heart muscle itself. And that can be, without treatment, 100% deadly and can cause a lot of complications. So we don't like to keep this in forever. But again, with appropriate antibiotic treatment, most people get better. So most people don't need to know a lot of all this in, about that information, but any medical resident or uh, medical student, this would be a valuable video to watch if you do have a patient with Lyme disease or Lyme carditis. For people in the general public, what should you do if you get Lyme disease? First off, where is Lyme disease found? The reason why it got its name was actually uh, from Lyme. Uh, it was a small community in Connecticut and a Yale physician was, had this, uh, a bunch of patients who had joint pain brought to their attention. I think it was in 1970s. And eventually they found that the reason why it would, happened was because of this bacteria. Now, if you notice a tick on you, things that you want to do first is remove it as soon as possible. You wanna get tweezers and try to get it at the very base because you want to try to get the mouth of the tick to remove it. Otherwise, if you take the body of it, you're gonna leave that mouthpiece <laughs> kind of attached to you. Um, do not, a lot of websites online will say covered in alcohol or, or uh, some type of gel. You don't want to wait for it to fall off on your own. You wanna take it off as soon as possible, as soon as you can quickly, and then dispose of it in a sealed bag, flush it down the toilet, or put it in some alcohol, that will kill it. The next thing you wanna do is try to think about temporally or time-wise, when did that tick get on you? Meaning, did you go into the woods one hour ago? Is that when you had your exposure? If you've, been, if you've been camping for a week and then you see a tick, you don't know when that tick got on you. Was it a week ago when you first got in here? Or was it an hour ago? And versus someone who went camping today and sees a tick on them, you can bet that they probably got that tick pretty recently. And the reason why it's important to know time-wise is because when you call your doctor, which you should do after you see a tick, is because we want to know that timeline because it's very important for the disease transmission. Um, gross alert, in case anyone's queasy, the reason why Lyme does, how Lyme disease is transmitted is when the tick attaches to you, it engorges on you, and it takes about 36 hours for the exo exodes tick to get so plump on your blood that it actually regurgitates your blood back into you. And in doing so, it takes the bacterium that's in the tick gut and transmits it to you. And that time period takes about 36 hours. So if I were to find the tick, put it on you and leave it on you for about an hour, we can remove it and not give you antibiotics and assume that you're probably not going to get Lyme disease. But Again, why I tell you that you should call your doctor and have that conversation with them is because the prophylactic treatment for Lyme disease is a one-time dose of oral doxycycline versus the treatment for Lyme disease can be anywhere from a 14 to 21 day treatment. So the long and skinny of this is whenever you go camping or go into a wooded area, please check for ticks. If you do see a tick, try to remove it as soon as possible and try to figure out when it got attached. And the importance of that is because it, the longer it's attached, the greater the chance that you will get, get Lyme disease. If you do get a tick, please call your doctor and have that conversation if you require a prophylactic dose or a treatment for Lyme disease. And if you have a tick or you've been exposed to a tick and you start feeling lightheaded, short of breath, palpitations, dizziness, or if you pass out, please, please call your doctor because you could have Lyme carditis. Lastly, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and subscribe. I'm going to be trying to publish a podcast as well so that if you're traveling or commuting and you don't have time to watch a YouTube video, I'll be able to go into deeper dives about different cardiology information for you.